Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar briefing. Uh, the Jerusalem Press Club has the honor to par partner up with Israel's most renowned security think tank, the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv. For those unfamiliar from abroad, the INSS conducts innovative, high-quality research that shapes the public discourse of issues on Israel's national security agenda and provides policy analysis and recommendations to decision makers, public leaders, and the, strate and the strategy community, both in Israel and abroad. For several decades now, Israelis have rung the alarm bell on Iran's intentions in the Middle East, though the long arm of the Islamic Republic stretches far beyond the Jewish state. Just yesterday, Israel allegedly targeted an Iranian cargo ship affiliated with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and the United States, meanwhile, officially resumed its efforts to re-enter the nuclear accord with Iran as the issue of sanctions imposed by the former administration remain a stumbling block. Today, we will discuss why the prevention of an Iranian bomb is not the only problem that lies ahead, and hear from three researchers with expertise in the field about another imminent threat, the next war in the North. Last month, the INSS concluded a two-year project examining this issue thoroughly. Its findings are chilling and recommendations important to hear. I'll just introduce the speakers first. Brigadier General in Reserves Udi Dekel is the Managing Director of the INSS. He has vast expertise, excuse me, has vast experience in the fields of intelligence, international military cooperation, and strategic planning. He heads the Israeli, he headed the Israeli team to negotiations with the Palestinians at the Annapolis summit. Process, prior to this, he filled many senior IDF positions, including head of the Foreign Relations Division and in the Air Force, commander of the Foreign Relations Unit, and head of the Research Division. His last IDF post was head of strategic planning. Lieutenant Colonel retired Orna Mizrahi heads the next war in the North project at the INSS and is a senior researcher. Mizrahi held a long career in the Israeli security establishment where she specialized in intelligence research and strategic planning processes in the IDF and for the political echelon. She served in the research department in the Intelligence Corps and the Strategic Division of the Planning Directorate, moving to the National Security Council at the Prime Minister's Office, where her last position was Deputy National Security Advisor for Foreign Policy. And our third speaker is Brigadier General in Reserves, Yuval Bazak, an expert on defense strategy and military doctrines and a senior consultant to the Doctrine and Training Department of the IDF's General Staff's Operations Director. In reserves, Bazak serves as the Chief of Staff of the Galilee Division, which operates on the Lebanese front. During his years in the IDF, he commanded the Samaria Brigade, the Helmand Brigade, and the Golani's 51st Battalion. His last position in the IDF was Defense Attaché to the Central European. So first of all, thank you everyone for being here and for hosting us at the JPC. Uh, before we begin, just a technical note for those of you joining who would like to send quest questions in real time, please do so in the chat box on Zoom, and we will do our best to get to them. So let's just begin with a little bit of background on the project itself. Um, as we have seen this week, uh, despite uh, the most recent uh, incident, global attention in concerning Iran mostly con is focused on the nuclear program. So why then is the INSS focusing on, on its other ambitions in the region in the context of this study. And Orna, I'd love for you to begin, please. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, well, I'll start by, by uh, remind what you have just said about the fact that we have started uh, the research this study uh, early in early 2019. And we felt at that time that although the Iranian nuclear uh, program is uh, one of the high priority threats that we are dealing with, that there is another uh, threat that is developing um, at that time and nowadays on the, uh, conve the conventional uh, military threat on the Northern uh, Front that we have to address it. And that was the reason why we, uh, we have decided to start this uh, study. Now, uh, it was uh, based on the understanding of a, a few assumptions that I would like to, uh, uh, to present now. The first was that, as I said, there is a, a conventional uh, uh, a threat that is developing, and we have to address it. 
And the second is that it, the, the next war on the northern front is going to be a different one. It is going to be uh, different than its previous because it's, it wouldn't be just a war between Israel and Lebanon. It's going to be a war between Israel and the whole, the entire uh, Shiite uh, axis because of the changes in the, uh, in the uh, strategic environment and the battlefield uh, as well. Uh, so we have to address it. Um, so I said, it's going to be a different uh, uh, war. And we uh, decided that we are going to deal with the worst uh, case scenario because Israel has to, the, the, the purpose of this uh, 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 memorandum that we've written and, uh, and the study was to help the, the decision-making uh, echelon, and the decision-makers in Israel and the, the uh, security establishment. So we thought that it will be better if we, are, we will deal with the uh, worst uh, case scenario. Uh, so we will be prepared for the, the worst uh, of all. And this is the, the, and so we were focusing on the uh, wide scale um, uh, war, but it's not saying that we, we think that this is what is going to happen. Uh, it, it's not, uh, we are not dealing with the like, likelihood that it will uh, erupt, uh, but we, we are dealing, we took the worst case scenario and uh, decided to work uh, according to that and see the implication of it for Israel. And the last one is about the fact that we thought that we have to look ahead, a decade ahead, uh, 10 years ahead to see, because there are going to be changes. If now we, we say that the, the chances to have uh, a, a wide scale um, war are, 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 not, are low, uh, it can uh, develop and uh, it can be changed. So. We have to look uh, ahead and see what are the changes and uh, be prepared for them. Okay, thank May you. May I add something? May I add something? Sure. Um, because uh, the main idea is that everybody look at Iran upon the issue of the nuclear and maybe the ballistic missiles. But there is nothing discussing in the international community and we have international dialogue with the, with the institute like us and strategic dialogues with foreign ministries and every time when we raise the issue of consolidation of uh, Iran in our northern arena, building up the military machine in order to attack Israel by missiles, by uh, tech UAVs, all the kind of missiles, and now they produce precise capabilities which they can hit strategic uh, targets inside Israel. For many fronts, we are not speaking only about Lebanon. It's Lebanon, it's Syria, it's Western Iraq, and even uh, 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 supporting uh, Hamas in Gaza. And, and, and they, they are building up and, and determined to build up those capabilities, even the crisis and even the coronavirus and even the economic crisis in Iran and the maximum pressure of the American administration, Trump administration, they are determined to proceed in building up those capabilities. And today, the main focus is how to change Syria, because they try in Syria to build up local, uh, internal uh, militias with, with the Iranian uh, guidance, training, equipment, and they are going to use them again against Israel. So, so this is very important, because what, I, what I'd like to know is I, I live in a country where things seem very calm right now on our northern borders. So what's really happening on the ground as you see it? As I started to say, they, for, for example, they build up uh, units inside Syria. They would like that Syria will be in the end state as Lebanon and as Iraq. In Lebanon, they have the Hezbollah, which is the main force in the, the monopoly of the power of Lebanon is Hezbollah. And, and the, in Iraq, the same situation that they build up the what we call the PNU, the local Shia militias, which they keep the monopoly of the power, and they can use them any time when they decide that this is the time to attack the American forces, the international coalition, or Israel. And they do the same now in Syria. They build up those capabilities that they can use them against us, not only terror. I spoke about uh, missiles, precise missiles, cruise missiles, 
attack UAVs, all those elements they would like one day to use their bank and ground attack capabilities by those uh, some kind of spatial uh, units which they can penetrate our border in the Golanites and the northern border with Israel, uh, trying to take over villages, kibbutzim, okay, uh, the, our, our settlements in that area, and, and by that trying to change the reality. The main focus is to keep Israel in long range engagement on the borders, that we will be all the time with problems along the borders, and by that they believe that we will not have time to deal with the main issue, which is Iran nuclear capabilities, on one hand, in order to deter us to do that, in, the, in order to deter us to do something against inside Iran. And you, both of you mentioned uh, briefly also in the Palestinian territories, what's the situation there like now in terms of Iranian... Uh, Especially in Gaza, because in the West Bank, we, we, we control in the, in the security level, but in Gaza, they support Hamas, Jihad Islamic Organization, Iranians, and other yeah. groups, Iran support them uh, to build up the same missiles, uh, UAVs, and other elements that they can attack Israel the day that they can get the order from the Iranian that this is the time to do that. Our assumption is that if there is a, a war, a wide scale war, the uh, the Palestinians in Gaza will also, the Hamas and the others, will also uh, may launch uh, missiles according to the order from uh, from Tehran. Right, a multi-front. So, so this is the worst case scenario that I was speaking about. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would like to uh, to dive a little bit deeply into the worst case scenario, but if we could just first talk about perhaps the prevention of the war, uh, if, if we are able to do such a thing. Uh, your memorandum talks about two alternatives that you examine to prevent this large-scale war. Um, so we're, we're seeing now that Israel obviously is acting where it needs to. Uh, we have, you know, occasional strikes in Syria and sometimes other defense activities in Iran itself. Um, how is Israel preventing the war currently? What is, what is the current policy being set in place, Udi? Okay, Israel has a concept that uh, we have to keep uh, what we call a uh, long-term confrontation or continued confrontation with, with Iran in, in order uh, to try uh, to minimize their ability to build up the power that they would like to use against us. We call it uh, the confrontation between the war. But this is continuous confrontation in, in order to, first of all, uh, achieve deterrence, but second, to say that we determine not to give the Iran the, the opportunity and the possibility uh, to build up the force and to change the arena as they like uh, like to do. And the third the aspect of that, uh, even if we lose the control of, uh, uh, of the escalation, we will be in better situation. If there is any situation that we arrive to be confrontation and even the war, a war with Iran and its proxies, we will be in better conditions to deal with them. So we, we have... You know, we, we cannot be tired. We have all the time uh, to, to, to act until something will change. Today, the main problem that Iran have the freedom of activity in Lebanon and in Syria and in Iraq, and they can do their whatever they like. Nobody tried to stop them from doing the things that they are doing there. Nobody tried to stop the consolidation process. And in many levels, we don't have time to elaborate about that. And, and, and this is only a problem of Israel. And it, you spot, it started with this, the issue of the, the revolutionary guard, the vassal in the Red Sea. You know, the, the, mess, the most important uh, response of the U.S. was that this is not us. This is Israel. Okay, nobody would like to go to any kind of uh, okay. engagement of tackle with the Iranians. This so is the problem of Israel. It's convenient that it's some. No, else's problem. and this is the problem of Israel, and 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 the reason that we have to continue in that in order not to give them the freedom of their activity. And I can tell you that there is a three-quarter success of the glass, which we prevented prevented them from doing a lot of things that they wanted to do. But still, there is the one quarter that they proceed, and they, they have pension, and they have time, and they have strategic view, 
and they're determined to, to proceed in that process, and we have to be determined in the same way. Very clear. I, I want just to add another, uh, another uh, issue, because the, the role of uh, national security actually is double. First is to put uh, the, the scenario, the worst case scenario uh, in front of us and uh, to prepare. But second is to take care that those scenarios will never come to the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, putting uh, 10 years as worst case scenario, it's not only say that this is what's going to happen. It's just a kind of a, a kind of a guideline to say we don't want to be there. And if we don't want to be there, we have to act now. Sure. This is something that is very, is very important, and it lies under uh, in the, in our memorandum all of, all, of, all of it. Right. So the other alternative, actually, that you discuss in your memorandum to prevent an all-out war, a full-scale war, was to take some sort of preemptive action uh, in the form of some military campaign. Um, so I I guess my question is two part: a What would this campaign look like? And b how is such a campaign legitimate in international eyes? And does something need to be done to, to inform the international community of, of this kind of possibility in order for it to be acceptable to our allies, uh, Orna? Well, I'll start by saying, by saying that uh, uh, Israel wants to avoid war. Uh, it's, it's very clear that we want to avoid war, but uh, we could get to the point that we have no other chance. As, as Udi has just uh, uh, presented, the uh, Iran and Hezbollah are continuing their military build-up to have these uh, very advanced uh, military offensive capabilities that maybe uh, Yuval la later will uh, uh, talk that. about it. Yeah. So if they are continuing uh, with that and the campaign between wars is not enough because it doesn't get its uh, required results because we we uh, just uh, we succeed in just uh, preventing or delaying the process but they, they are continuing with the, this military build up so maybe we'll get to the point that we'll have no other chance to but to do something and what we thought that is better to recommend about is to do some very limited focus uh, attack uh, that will deal with the main problem that Israel is seeing now, that is the precision uh, missile uh, program. This is one of our main challenges and uh, that we look at it all the time, that they are trying to accumulate more and more uh, precision uh, missiles. And so maybe we'll get to the point that Israel will have to uh, uh, to initiate such a, a strike, but it should be a very limited focusing on these core uh, uh, capabilities that are aiming Israel, uh, especially Israel uh, civilian uh, arena. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know the main challenge of this uh, um, alternative is that you, you can't control. A, 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 the scope or the duration of of, uh, of this uh, campaign, and it can you know it can uh, escalate to a full full scale war. So we have to take uh, this as 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 uh, it's the main uh, disadvantage advantage and challenge. But maybe we'll get to the point that we'll have to do that. Uh, so this is one of the options that we have put, and we put also the advantages and the disadvantages for the decision makers to decide when and how to conduct such an attack. I'm sorry, another time to add something which I'm sure that it's not clear enough. Iran delivers precise capabilities to actors which are proxies without any state responsibility. Those which are not taking into consideration all the uh, consequences that come after in and after a war situation. And those, some of them use, feel that they have toys, that they would like to use those toys. And now we have to wait and to see when and why they will use those toys against Israel. So there is, uh, there is numbers of missiles, arsenal of missiles, which can create major threat to Israel and we have to prevent it. And if we see that, that they are coming to this number of missiles, I'm not want to say the number, we have to do something. As, as Oma said, first of all, we are going to
some kind of uh, military uh, uh, activity against those capabilities, not all, not against Lebanon, not against Syria, not Very against limited, and limited uh, operation against those capabilities and taking the risk that we will not control the level of escalation and we will find ourselves in war situation. Okay, so uh, in the event that neither of these alternatives work, the first being the campaign between the wars that Israel is trying to manage and the second being a uh, limited yeah. preemptive strike, um, Perhaps, Yuval, you can elaborate. What is the worst case scenario that we're looking at? What is this war? What will its damage and impact be to the parties? First, I want to elaborate that after almost uh, five decades, we are uh, against, again, uh, uh, coping with a, a potential uh, fundamental threat uh, over Israel. It wasn't the case in the last uh, four uh, decades, and this is a major change in our national security perspective that we have to deal with. Now, it uh, actually uh, generated by, by the imperialist ambition of Iran. And now we have to understand that Iran clearly declare, and not only declare, uh, pushing in full power the idea of uh, establishment of a, a Shiite empire in the Middle East. Now, Israel is the main threat to Iran, the main obstacle. And Iran is actually building a force conventional force in order to, uh, to destroy Israel. And clear, uh, clear as, uh, and simple as, as it, uh, as it uh, as sound. Now we are most of the time focusing in the, in the nuclear, but I think the nuclear is mainly uh, the, the part of the package that have to give the Iranian uh, immunity. After seeing uh, Saddam Hussein, after seeing, uh, uh, after seeing uh, Gaddafi, they know that if you want to, uh, if you want to promote your interest uh, beyond your borders, you have to get an ammunition. So I think that this is the, the idea of the nuclear, but the main tool they are going to, uh, to use in order to destroy Israel, or what, like we say, to, uh, to shake the national uh, security of, uh, of Israel, uh, it's by the conventional uh, forces that they are building step by step. It started with Lebanon, now we see Syria, we see the, the takeover of Gaza, which is 100% now, uh, uh, not, maybe not 100%, but it's very, uh, very much identified with Iranian uh, interest. Now building, uh, just imagine the, the, the mastermind is in Tehran, but the hands are already uh, uh, coming to our borders. They built a, a conventional uh, state-like uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, which are built in order to attack Israel whenever they will decide that this is the time. It could be uh, in five years, it could be uh, in 10 years, it could be when they will feel that they have enough power to uh, achieve their goals, or it could be because they have uh, pressure from the strategic uh, uh, arena or from the inside, uh, 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 from inside uh, Iran. Whatever uh, the reason will cause it, they are uh, actually uh, plan to take all this uh, power that they build and actually shoot it into Israel. It mainly build on mass, massive, uh, precise, but not only precise, uh, even uh, 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 also a statistic uh, missiles from various distance, from various uh, uh, battleheads, so they could uh, uh, point out those, uh, those power capability into what they uh, seems like our, uh, our uh, weakness, the, uh, the home front uh, or the society of uh, Israel. Like they said, this is, Israel is very strong in its muscles, but the Israeli society is like the spider web that are very, uh, very, uh, uh, let's say, weak and- Maybe sensitive. Are, what? Maybe sensitive. sensitive. It's sensitive, well, yes. yes. And if we are going to press them, if we are going to shoot from all those frontiers together, those kinds of missiles, if we are going to destroy, uh, and Israel is a very small country, so right now potentially they cover all the strategic the assets of Israel. They, they actually uh, covered our airports, our... our uh, seaports, our electricity power station, everything. 
So uh, being able to shoot together in parallel from three, uh, uh, three frontiers together into the uh, home front of Israel, into the, the civilian uh, uh, of Israel, and actually to do two things to destroy the, uh, the capability or the ability of uh, the, the war machine of Israel to uh, move uh, or to, uh, to, uh, 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 to come uh, to uh, uh, impress uh, its, uh, its power uh, or to uh, mobilize the forces to the frontiers and uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, go uh, into the, the, the places that they are shooting from. This is uh, one thing. And the second one is actually uh, to uh, hit the Israeli moral. And uh, this kind of war in their, uh, in their mind could uh, make a major damage to the Israeli uh, uh, self-security, uh, uh, to the Israeli image of itself. And uh, this, is, this is kind of things that uh, will shake the Israeli national uh, security. Now, another thing that, uh, another element that they are working very hard in the recent years is that uh, to build the, the assault forces, the ground uh, attack forces, mm -hmm. uh, they already have it uh, in the Hezbollah, uh, and 6, in the Golan Heights also. And now they are trying to, they are starting to build it uh, uh, in the Golan Heights. And the idea is actually to, uh, to uh, concord places uh, in the Galilee, in the Golan, in order to, uh, to create a, a front defense. Uh, and keep their uh, their, their uh, capabilities uh, to uh, uh, to shoot uh, missiles uh, into Israel. Actually, it's to uh, defense against the Israeli maneuver, uh, to uh, actually keep the maneuver, the Israeli maneuver, uh, in the front line while they are keep shooting from uh, the rare area of Lebanon and Syria, and potentially Iraq, Gaza, and even from Iran into Israel, and this is the picture they see in their eyes. Uh, I must say that this is uh, the picture that we have to prevent. Of course. And uh, if we will have to cope with it, we are now actually building the capabilities in order to, uh, to do so, uh, so in, in effective way. So is Israel capable of defending itself on a multilateral attack? You've mentioned five different points of attack. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Five different theaters we never uh, actually uh, uh, experienced in such an uh, issue. And this is why we say it's not going to be similar to the uh, previous wars. It's not going to be similar to the Israeli-Arab wars. It's not going to, uh, to be similar to the Israeli-Hezbollah war or to the Israeli-Palestinian war. It, it's going to be different. And history... And little hard to ask why we don't learn from history. What we are trying to do is to uh, actually illustrate the future, trying to uh, to uh, to uh, create uh, the worst case scenario as it might uh, uh, as it might be. And like I say, in uh, two ways: first, try to uh, uh, to prevent it, and second, try to uh, build the capabilities to cope if the time will come. Can I add just one sentence about the ground attack? I think that it's very important for them because it's a, a, it's symbol. If they, they uh, succeed to uh, conquer even, you know, a very small part of uh, Israeli territory in the 67 uh, lines, it's a great achievement. Uh, it's a great symbol that you have uh, done something that never occurred. So I think that they are to put the flag in the middle yeah, to of put the flag on the north Israel, of Israel. Israeli settlement to put it's, the flag. Uh, so they, they put enormous effort this is the image on that. of a win. Yeah. This was the purpose of the tunnels, but now they don't have so much of the tunnels, but they are still uh, uh, continuing with this uh, uh, um, maneuvers to, to try to conduct such an attack. Okay, let's move on a little bit to what kind of impact this war would actually have. Who, who would most suffer from this, this development, perhaps Israel's response? What would that look like? And what would, what would the region be left with at the end of the day? <laughs> before, this is, before you are saying, okay. I would like to say something, because this is one of the purpose of this uh, uh, work, because the response of the Israeli side uh, will create a lot of damage on the other side of the border. 
And we have to remember something that I'm not sure that everybody understands. If you are a young couple in Lebanon and you would like to purchase a, a house for your family, so what you are doing, you're going to Hezbollah and ask them to aid you in order to build up the house. They said, okay, we will, we will assist you to build up the house, but one room is for us. And one room with, this is the room with the missile launcher. Inside the, in, inside the house, in the, okay, in the indoor area, and all the villages in southern Lebanon and in other places in Lebanon, we have a good picture in Israel, most of them not full picture, but good picture. They took the urban area and created as a launching position against Israel. So what we have to do, this is for us a military locations. We have to destroy them. So there will be a lot of collateral damage on the other side of the border. And our chief of general staff said that in our, uh, our institute, the uh, annual conference two months ago, that there will be a lot of damage in Lebanon because we have to destroy those missile launchers or the other things which they are using from this, this area. And this is something you have to understand. They are not only using a weapon against civilians in our side, they are, uh, they are using... Hello? We call it human shields. They are using the population as human shields. Okay, it's a sure land. No. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is the main idea. They are attacking civilians and using civilians as the human shield. So in that case, the casualties and the collateral damage, we will try to, uh, of course, to try to limit it, but uh, uh, there will be another picture on the other side of the, of the border and somebody has to understand. So this is one uh, uh, issue. The other issue is how uh, the, the ability to stop, what kind of exit strategy you, you have when you start a war situation. And now we are in situation that there is no really, maybe something will change, but there is no really international community. There is no any international capabilities to say to the, those actors, enough is enough. In the Middle East, everybody understand the language of power, the language of damage. People don't understand la diplomatic language in order to solve the problems. So there is also the problem how we can, even there is now, it's a war situation, how we can stop it. So what is our exit strategy? What well, is it, our exit strategy? Yes. yes. And uh, maybe Yuval you can say something. One of the things that we don't like to do, but in any case we will have to do, is what we call a, a ground operation inside the, the, the territory of the other side, uh, uh, running in the direction of the capitals which saying that we are not playing any, any uh, game. We are going to the middle of the problem and it will change dramatically the reality all around. Sure. In simple words, our uh, response has to be destructive and, uh, and, very, and doing it very fast. So the international community will have to interfere and uh, try to do something about it. Very clear. Uh, I'll just say that in Israel, our spare room is reserved for bomb shelters to defend yeah. our civilians and not for attacking purposes. Um, I know that Orna already mentioned that you don't want to talk about the likelihood of this all-out war from occurring, and you've mentioned you know five years, ten years, just so that we can have something in our heads, but it's not actually a date. So I won't ask you what the likelihood of this happening is or how much time we are looking at, but what I will ask is what catalyst do we have uh, on, on the ground, maybe it's the missiles you mentioned, or what are, what are, what are the developments that could happen here for, the, for this large scale war to occur? Well, um, we put in the memorandum, we talked about initiation, uh, the possibility of initiating the war by one of the sides. And we think that nowadays is not a really uh, an option. Maybe if Israel is going to a, a very focused, a preemptive uh, 
uh, attack. But we, uh, the, the second uh, group of, uh, of uh, triggers comes from the uh, possibility of escalation or deterioration or miscalculation of uh, one of, uh, of the side. You have said before that the, that the northern border is calm. It's not. The north, our northern border is not calm, especially because of the continuous of the uh, military buildup of uh, Hezbollah. And we had some uh, incidents along the northern border along the last uh, uh, one or two years. And uh, you have to, uh, to remember that Hezbollah is still trying to revenge what they say that we have tried to do to them. Um, and we killed one of the reactivists in one of the attacks that is uh, uh, that they said that Israel was doing it in Syria, and now they want to revenge. The fact is that they are more contained lately because of the bad situation in Lebanon, but it can be changed. And uh, Nasrallah is talking all the time about his uh, strategic patience, that he can wait and uh, we can uh, retaliate in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, later on. Uh, so there is no calm, there is a tension on the northern uh, border. The IDF is there and is uh, very much ready for, uh, for uh, surprises. Uh, and uh, we have uh, to take in account the possibility of, uh, of uh, deterioration. This is one about the, uh, the relation uh, between Israel vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah. But I think that um, uh, the, uh, what is going on on the Northern Front also uh, uh, is used by Iran because it's a leverage for Iran in uh, to advance its interest in uh, in, in the region. And uh, Udi was talking about it uh, earlier about what Iran wants to achieve. Even you know, uh, it's a leverage uh, to uh, uh, to what is going on on the talks about the nuclear uh, agreement. So. It's on the table all the time, the possibility, and you know, the, the, the capabilities are there. So the, the possibility that it will occur is there. We think that the, the, it's, the chances that it will happen in the near future is, are very low, but we have to take in account the possibility that it will happen. You know, I always, uh, <clears throat> I always mention to ourselves that the, the 12th of July, 2006 started as a beautiful blue sky days, uh, very quiet, and it ended up with a full-scale war uh, at the same day. Wars uh, don't, never have a date uh, on the diary. They are just a uh, wrap. Uh, sometimes it's uh, because one of the sides have uh, intentions that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, or uh, let's say, have a situation that uh, push it uh, into uh, the initiative of a war. And sometimes it's just a miscalculation or a escalation. And uh, we are not very far from those uh, scenarios. You know, last, uh, last uh, summer, we, had, uh, we experienced uh, two, uh, two uh, attack of uh, Hezbollah that uh, luckily uh, they didn't uh, succeed. It. But if they, they would succeed, I, get the, the, I guess that the reaction of Israel was a, a massive one. And it could be very easily go into an uh, escalation uh, uh, and even into a war. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, we have to uh, we have to prevent the the, the conditions that uh, will bring uh, Iran to the decision to go into war. And part of it sometimes is a friction with the uh, with the capabilities build up of Iran that are creating uh, the potential escalation that could bring us to a war. And it, it's a very uh, you know it's a kind of a, a, a uh, risk management that uh, we are doing, and uh, nobody uh, give us uh, uh, give us the promise that it it will uh, it will end us uh, end up as as we want. Does Iran or its proxies have an interest for such a war? There's a conception mm -hmm. worldwide now that there is no interest. Is Not true? now. Look, right now they want to actually get gain more power. Mm -hmm. Now they feel that they are not the strong side. So you never go to a war, uh, to a war if you are the weak side. And I guess that, and I think that uh, right now, when Iran look at the balance between uh, Israel, US and, uh, and itself and its proxies, 
it still feel that is not they are not in the in the place that they were where they can uh, uh, achieve their goals but the ambition to build up the force the ambition to change the balance will uh, uh, could bring them to the point that they will be or feel uh, enough confidence in order to go into a conflict there is two elements the first one which Iran try to build up capabilities in order to deter Israel from attacking Iranian nuclear facilities inside Iran so they believe if there will be a lot of capabilities that they can attack Israel inside Israel by all its proxies uh, we that will prevent us from attacking the nuclear facilities in Iran or if we attack the nuclear facilities in Iran they have the ability to respond because in the Middle East you must respond this is the problem of the dynamic of the escalation even uh, nobody would like to escalate the situation to war but you have to respond to the other side this is one issue the second issue which is it is more important and that that's one of the reasons behind that project is That Iran also build up capabilities in order uh, uh, they would like to see that Israel is bleeding along of our borders that we are all the time in frictions in our uh, our borders that we will not have time even to deal with the problem of the nuclear inside Iran because we have all the time to deal with the problems along the borders and this is one of the things that they are built up now and, and, and we have to be ready for that And of course, we have to decide if we are playing their game or we will create another game. And, and one of the issues that is important for us, because in any case, when you arrive to a war situation, we would like to shape better reality the day after. So what is better reality in the Middle East? How you can describe the better reality in the Middle East? When you look, see the situation in Lebanon, which is not any functioning country, How we can make Lebanon a functioning country when you look upon Syria, which is not also a functioning country? This is, this is an, uh, how you take Syria out from the Iranian hands and, and build something positive there. The same in, in Iraq. We spoke about uh, uh, Western Iraq. So, so it's very difficult, and this is the issue with, which we are saying, why we don't see any positive outcome from war because after the war we don't see that we can shape better reality in the, this region maybe less, the, less threats on yeah, and, and, less yes. threats. Mm-hmm. and this is a, yeah. the case you know right now there is the trend of uh, the ambitious of Iran that uh, uh, generate the situation the geopolitical uh, issues uh, in the Middle East and you see now the axis of uh, conflict is between Sunnah and Shia and Israel is the moderate Shia side and uh, Of course, right now, everybody is focused on how to stop or how to eliminate this, uh, this threat that uh, Iran is de- uh, determined to, uh, to uh, uh, keep, uh, uh, keep uh, pushing uh, forward. And uh, the, the question of uh, what could uh, be the impact of uh, this war is a very, you know, again, nobody could uh, uh, predict what will be, what would Europe look like after the Second World War, but everybody knew that they have to to cope with a, with a Nazi uh, threat. And this is something that, uh, that uh, we learned along uh, the history. And I think war, and this is why we are doing everything to, uh, to prevent or to not coming to the point that we will have to, uh, to, to fight, not because we want, because we, we understand the consequence. And, uh, but on the other side, Israel, uh, whenever it stood uh, against a, a fundamental threat or existing threat, Uh, uh, threat it, uh, it cope uh, with it and the uh, Israeli society uh, and I think that this is something that uh, Hezbollah and Iran uh, don't really understand uh, the Israeli society could uh, go uh, uh, far away to, uh, to achieve peace sometimes in the Middle East it looked like a weakness but Israel when it stood against uh, against a threat uh, existing out threat war uh, most of the time uh, unified the Uh, and uh, and uh, strike back very strong I think that the uh, Iranian are uh, are uh, going to make the mistake of uh, the Arab world in the in the previous uh, in the Arab Israeli conflict but again the war and this is something that Udi say uh, will be all-out war from the Israel side we are going to strike because when our uh, homes 
are uh, threatened by missiles, when our strategic assets are uh, threatened by uh, missiles. Uh, there is no proportionality that we have to take care in order to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, fight back. And I think in this case, because Hezbollah and uh, uh, in Gaza also, they build their facilities in, inside the, the civilian area. And Hezbollah itself built inside the Lebanese war, uh, uh, state, it will, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, striking and making damage, collateral damage, it's something that uh, we will not uh, be able uh, to, to avoid. On the other hand, I think that uh, if Syria, because we understand that we don't want to uh, destroy Syria, and we don't want to destroy uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, we want to uh, liberate them from the Iranian uh, hold. And this is something that uh, if we say that on the one hand, we have to, uh, to uh, act very powerful, on the other hand, we will have to make it wise in order to, uh, that after the war, we will have liberate Lebanese that might be developed to a, a, another, uh, another state and the same for Gaza and the same for, uh, for Syria. And this is something that uh, we have to to put on the table. Okay, uh, there are a few things that uh, we'd like to get to before we finish because we are running out of time. Uh, one of the reporters is asking something specifically on what you touched, Yuval, which is how Israel can better improve its uh, home front uh, uh, preparedness. Mm -hmm. What can be done? So we have uh, actually uh, two systems, the active uh, defense and the passive uh, defense, and uh, Israel is uh, well organized. And uh, we have to say Israel is very much, I think it, we are the most advanced uh, mm -hmm. state in the world, uh, being able to uh, cope with enemies, those, anyway. uh, yeah, uh, be able to cope with those uh, threats. And from the, 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 the spare uh, room in your house, Build on, uh, build upon concrete, uh, till the the, the anti-missile uh, system that we have. But I think that uh, in this case, in, in this kind of threat, we will not uh, be able to avoid a massive, uh, a massive uh, uh, maneuver in order to uh, stop this uh, missile launching. And this is part of uh, of the things that uh, we have to take under consideration. Very clear. Um, I think the last issue that I'd like to discuss with you is uh, really how current events might be might be uh, encouraging Iran to to continue these kinds or even um, increase these kinds of activity. If, for instance, we're looking at the fact that the United States is now officially returning to uh, to talks with Tehran uh, regarding the JCPOA or some version of it, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at the fact that sanctions could be removed or changed in some way? Are these activities that could maybe strengthen their confidence? Could, mm -hmm. these, could this have some sort of impact on the other activities you've described? Mm -hmm. Yes, for well, sure. First of all, we have to see now the situation that they are attacking everywhere in the Middle East and nobody responds, only Israel. Nobody responds against the Iranian attacks in Saudi Arabia, in the, uh, the American ones, the American forces, every every day there is some activity against the American forces in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Nobody responds for that. Yemen, which <laughs> they are launching missiles, rockets, they, they can attack Israel from the southern part also, of this, from this area with the long distance cruise missiles, which they have there. And we know that they attacked other places uh, in the, the, nobody responds for that. They're attacking uh, ships, vessels, nobody responds for that. So they, they believe that they can do because there, this is the game. You know, the Iranian all the time checking what is the rule of the game. If there is no response, so we can do another stage in our activity. And, 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 and this creates a, a, a risk of escalation. Israel cannot accept it. So Israel tried to respond. Somebody tell, tell us in the Middle East, we have new friends now in the Middle East, that they are saying that Iran is afraid of attacking Israel directly because they know that we will respond, not like Saudi Arabia and the others. I don't know. Uh, this is not insurance. So, so this is one, one element which it, it's very important to, to, to understand. Uh, uh, second, as we saw, you know, uh, uh, after the JCPOA and uh, using, uh, 
uh, moving the sanctions from Iran, they had a lot of money. What they did with that money? Do they build up Iran uh, economy and infrastructure or better situation for the Iranian people? They use that uh, money in order to give to, to all the bad guys, to all the proxies here in the Middle East. You know, in Syria, you can pay $100 for a person. He will fight for you. He will fight for you for $100. So now we see 30 new groups, militias in southern Syria, which they run and build up by Syrians, which they give them money. So if they have more money, they will, they will build up more units like that. You have to look and, at what happening with Hezbollah. They mm -hmm. had problems with getting the Iranian money because of the American sanction late right. in the last two years. And now if it will going to be changed, they will uh, have it again and will, uh, will be stronger inside Lebanon and will build, continue to build their uh, capabilities, military capabilities with the Iranian uh, money. And I think another point to say is, uh, it's important to remind us, what just have uh, the um, uh, Israeli military uh, intelligence has published recently, that the, uh, you have asked about deteriorating into, uh, into a war, that the uh, Hezbollah is uh, uh, willing and uh, has intention to, um, to initiate a very short confrontation along the border in the next year. This is something that we have to take uh, uh, into account. And this, if Hezbollah, if they have more confidence when the, uh, Iran is not under the sanction and, and Hezbollah is not under the sanction, Hezbollah also is under sanctions of the Americans if they change their attitude towards Hezbollah. They can feel more confident that they can do such uh, acts and such acts can deteriorate the situation. And uh, we'll get to the point that uh, we, don't, we want to avoid of having this uh, uh, full-scale uh, war. This, this is a big dilemma. One yeah, sentence. This is a big dilemma because on the one hand, we know when we say loud and clear that the nuclear threat is the main threat. And it's better to focus upon the nuclear threat than the, the others. The priority of dealing with the nuclear threat is more important than the others. So we would like that the, the, everybody will concentrate, concentrate. <laughs> sorry, in the nuclear issue and not bringing to the table other things. But on the other side, Iran played the game with the other elements, okay? So we cannot speak about nuclear without speaking about ballistic missiles because the ballistic missiles uh, had, uh, warheads will be the platform for nuclear military nuclear capabilities. So we have to deal with that. Now everybody- In the context of a new agreement or separately? Of course, of course. But because you cannot happen. speak about the issue of Iran nuclear without the platform that delivery, the, the, the bomb. I know that everybody is quiet because the Supreme uh, Leader of Iran said that they got, uh, send a message to his people not more than 2,000 kilometers. Okay, it's not Europe. It's only Israel and uh, other Middle East countries, not more than 2,000 kilometers. So this is an issue. So we said that in the current situation, it's better to focus upon the fourth, the fourth element uh, 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 with the nuclear deal that I, I hope that the international community will deal with the Iranian in that case. This is the sunset. This is the missiles. This is the, the, uh, on the issue of the inspections and especially dealing with the military uh, dimension of, of that. But, on the other hand, we can manage now the situation about the region. Because if, if everybody is focused upon the issue of the nuclear, we can manage the issue, but not for the long term. Because as I said, we said before, if Iran have more money, more ability, more freedom of action, and, and the legitimacy, nobody say a word about the Iranian legitimacy to operate all over the, the Middle East, unbelievable. Yeah. To unstable and this is an unprecedented uh, mm -hmm. issue. I think that not, like Udi said, 
Not many understand that uh, the phenomena of uh, Iran is an unprecedented uh, in the last uh, decades in the, in the geopolitical world. It's a state that uh, won't actually uh, act, not only have the ideology say that we want to be an empire, they are also building a capability to do so. And they're also acting with those capability in order to achieve those or to promote this uh, strategy. And all those things have to lead us to the uh, conclusion that uh, uh, this is not a, a one-point effort, nuclear weapon program or whatever. This is a, a this have to be a unified, international, in order to prevent war. In a war, Israel will stand and uh, do whatever it needs to do. We want, we don't want to be there. And this is a kind of thing that international uh, 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 the international community have to understand because Iran is pushing the limits step by step. And we are going to uh, achieve, if it's going to, uh, to, uh, to continue like this, we will go into, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to reach the, the red line that we will not uh, be able to, uh, to stand it anymore. Understood. I think this is also a very good place to, to close our, our discussion. Uh, you've left us and I'm sure all the viewers with a very uh, bleak picture of uh, the reality before us. Uh, but anyway, can read it. <laughs> of course, uh, so I was going to say the memorandum can be found on the INSS website. And of course, we're happy to share the, the link with everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of you for, for speaking with me today. Udi Dekel, Yuval Bazak, Ona Mizrahi. Thank you. And for the Institute for National Security Studies for hosting the Jerusalem Press Club for this uh, very yes. unique opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.